Right. Well, I think we can go ahead and get started for today. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us for our first CAF Corner webinar brought to you by Home and Lau and CAF Tell. My name is Abby, and I'm the digital marketing coordinator over here at CAF Tell here in Germantown, Wisconsin. Um, so we've got a couple representatives from different areas um, in the U.S. and in the world. Um, so we're excited to be here today. Um, if you're not familiar with CAFTEL, we specialize in creating durable, cost-effective plastic CAF housing solutions. Um, we offer a multitude of products, indoor CAF pens, outdoor CAF hutches, group housing options, as well as uh, metal fencing options. Um, we've been in the business for over 40 years now, and we've been serving the dairy community um, happily. So we're excited to be here today, and um, we're going to be covering a couple different CAF topics today. And like I said before, we'll be hearing from two different global perspectives. Um, first, joining us from Germany, we have Holger Cruz. He will pre be presenting on CAF Feeding 101. And then second, we have Kelly Driver, who is from the U.S., and she'll be talking about CAF Housing 101. Just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. We do plan on having a question and answer time at the end of our presentations today. Um, so we just ask that if you have any questions, you go ahead and type them into the chat box on the right-hand side of your screen. And then at the bottom of the chat box, you'll notice a two, um, and then you can choose all panelists and attendees. And that way we're able to see the questions as well as all of our attendees are able to see the questions. So just be sure to send your questions to that area. Now, without further ado, I'm excited to introduce to you Holger Cruz. Holger is the marketing manager over at Home and Lau in Germany. Holger, will you go ahead and please introduce yourself and talk a little bit about your background in calf care as well as some details on what Home and Lau even does? Yeah. Abby, thank you very much for, for the introduction and I'm um, yeah, really happy to have this first uh, joint webinar with, with Kaftel. Um, yeah, I'm the, uh, like you said, marketing manager here at Home and Lauer, but um, yeah, not only marketing, I'm also uh, responsible for uh, customer and dealer training. Um, and also I have been working for the last uh, yeah, more or less 20 years uh, for Home and Lauer in sales and consultancy and traveled the world um, yeah, about calf uh, feeding equipment. Let me say a few words about Home and Lauer for the ones of you who uh, don't know us yet. Uh, I'm not sure if that is actually possible, but um, yeah, so... So we are at home and now we are producing feeding equipment for calves. As you can see here on the top, we have an automatic calf feeder um, with ident uh, identification of calves and individual feeding of these calves. And we have the yeah, rather famous milk taxi, which is um, uh, yeah, capable to feed calves in individual hutches as well in groups. Um, and the milk taxi also allows us to, to pasteurize milk, for example, and has multiple options. So feeding uh, equipment of calves, that is one of our um, main uh, business. And uh, the other one is as well uh, calf housing. Um, so we have developed uh, a large group hutch, a large group igloo, as you can see here on the, on the right side, on the lower right side, which is good for about, uh, yeah, housing 14, 15 calves, um, but also, and that maybe is closing the, the circle with Calftel. We are also Calftel uh, representative over here in Europe. Um, so we distribute the Calftel hutches uh, with our, uh, yeah, little bit own um, program, which we call a calf garden, because for us, especially in, um, in a harsh winter uh, or when, when it's raining a lot, uh, then we always recommend to cover the um, calf hutches with a roof. And um, so this is basically what uh, we are doing here. So um, yeah, so we care about calves, um, not only feeding, also housing. So we, um, we try to have a full 
full concept um, here. Great. Thank you. Let's go ahead and dive right into our first topic then today. We're going to be talking about calf feeding 101. Holger, can you tell us a little bit about why proper feeding and care of young calves is such an important first step in raising healthy, productive replacement animals to enter your milking herd? Yeah, I would like to do that. But I think before we start, I would um, yeah, like to get a, a little bit of background from, from the audience, which we have. And we have prepared a small survey. Um, and I ask Marco now to start the first uh, survey. And I would like to ask the, the audience to, to answer three questions for me um, about your um, preferences. So the first question is, uh, what level of uh, daily weight gain are you aiming for uh, before weaning calves? Huh? So are you, focus, uh, are you aiming for 500 grams per day or yeah, uh, one pound? Are you aiming for 750 uh, or one and a half pounds? Are you aiming for 1,000 gram or two pounds or even more than that? So that's the first question. And the second question is, how much milk do you actually feed per day? Um, four liters or four quarts, six liters, six quarts, eight liters, eight quarts, or even more than eight liters. So I'm really interested to see that. And uh, yeah, last but not least, when do you wean your calves? At which age? With six weeks, eight, 10 weeks, or even later than 10 weeks? So um, yeah, please um, yeah, answer these questions for us. Uh, and then I can use this information um, in my, my presentation as well. So I see already that most of you are aiming for two pounds per day, daily weight gain, or even more than that. That's, that's interesting. Um, and the majority is feeding eight liters and more, although six liters, quite a few as well. Um, and um, so I still give you another, yeah, like say 10 seconds or so until we, uh, until we will show the results. Um, yeah. Thank you very much for attending. Marco, are you going to uh, please show show the results to the uh, to the audience? So we see here the majority is really aiming for 1,000 gram of daily weight gain. Um, so most of the people, most of you, are feeding eight liters and more, and weaning your calves with eight to ten weeks of age. I think that's really interesting and um yeah so that really brings me to the next uh back to your question abby thank you very much so um marco thank you very much i think we can close that survey now um yeah so what what is about uh what's the main focus to feed um yeah healthy and, and, and productive uh, animals um and the point is, um, yeah, that we all, uh, so that, that, that we know nowadays that feeding calves a high level of uh, plane of nutrition in order to uh, receive good daily weight gain and 1000 gram daily weight gain, I think is a lot, um, has, uh, has uh, great ben uh, benefits. Um, so here, for example, uh, you will see an, an overview of um, of some of these benefits and i'm going to share just quickly i'm going to share um, a small document here uh, in the chat area which you can download um, which explains basically what you see here in the screen um, if we are able to feed calves more milk uh, more than we traditionally did and that means eight liters ten liters and more um, we see that calves are showing better daily weight gain. Uh, so they are, we are able to breed them earlier, which is uh, reducing uh, our rearing cost. Um, 
So, for example, to re, uh, reduce uh, the uh, first calving age by one month is probably uh, saving us about 60 US dollars in, in rearing cost. Um, we know that, um, that there's also a relation uh, to more milk production. Um, Fernando Soberon, for example, he showed a result. Uh, and Marco, maybe you can share this link as well. Um, he has some test results where he can say that uh, for every 100 gram daily weight gain increase, uh, so uh, you can expect like 100 kilogram more milk production at the end. So uh, if you are used to have 500 gram daily weight gain and you're able to lift that to 1000 gram, you can expect like 500 kilogram more in, um, in, uh, in milk production. And I think that's already quite a big, uh, a big thing. So when it comes to raising healthy calves and ensuring they're receiving proper nutrition, what kind of goals should we be putting in place when creating a feeding program for the calves? Um, I mean, yeah, the goals, the, the goal is, I think that we, we set that in the, in the survey already. I think daily weight gain is, um, is one of the few um, benchmarks uh, where we can set goals. Um, and it's, and it's a good benchmark. Um, and, um, and I know that there, uh, that there is a, a standard saying, okay, we would like to double the birth weight until weaning of these calves. Yeah. But if we, for example, uh, do the math, if a calf is born uh, with 40 kilogram of, uh, yeah, weight, and we are weaning, uh, and, and we are aiming for um, doubling the birth weight for example, until eight weeks of age. So that's 80 kilogram to eight weeks of age. Um, instead of the 1000 kilogram, which everybody's aiming for, this goal only uh, leads us to a daily weight gain of about 700 gram. So doubling the birth weight as a weight, as, as a goal in your rearing is actually not enough if you're aiming for 1000 grams. So the calves even have to grow more than that. Um, yeah, and the second and the second aim, if I think, uh, and everybody agrees that we want to uh, have the have us calving as early as possible, so 23, 24 weeks of uh, months. Sorry, um, that's what what we're aiming for. And in order to reach that, yeah, in theory, also we need to have a daily weight gain of about 850 gram over the whole two years period. Um, and we also know that rearing a heifer in the later age uh, is not so easy because if we feed too much energy, they're getting too fat and with all the negative influences. So it's better to put on weight early, let's say the first yeah, half year, um, and then to take the break on and to, to limit the um, um, yeah, growth. Um, and we are still able to receive very good performing um, heifers. Okay. Um, yeah, sorry, I just wanted to continue with my presentation. And what does it actually mean when we, um, uh, when we look at the energy demand of these calves? Um, so for example, um, a lot of uh, you were feeding like six liters of, uh, of milk, but feeding six liters of milk is meeting the energy demand for a calf like we can see here, um, of 50 and 60 megajoule per day. Um, but this allows the calf only to grow 400 gram per day. If we are really aiming for 1000 gram daily weight gain, um, we need 20 to 22 megajoule of energy for a 50 kilogram calf. Uh, so this calculates into about nine liters of home milk or 1.5 kilogram of um, CMR, which is, um, which is a lot, I know. But um, if we are really aiming for 1,000 gram daily weight gain, we need to adapt our feeding programs to uh, feed more energy to the calves. 
So when you're coming up with the nutrition plan or the feeding program, would you say there's one universal way to be doing this or should programs be more specialized and personalized to each herd CAFR operation? Um, yeah, I think a lot of people say that every farm is different. And uh, so that means we need to have different feeding programs for different uh, circumstances. Um, and uh, yeah, just let me uh, give uh, maybe a little bit proactive uh, answer saying, I don't think that that's the case. Um, for example, take pig and poultry, for example, um, there they have really standardized feeding programs for the piglets and for uh, and, the, and the young chicks. Um, so there's not, not a lot of variation uh, there. And even with cow nutrition, uh, it seems to me that we are quite uh, on, on the same level. So also there with the cows, we know how much energy we want to feed them in order to, for them to produce a certain amount of milk. Um, so yeah, a part of the available different quality of forage. Um, I think there's not so much variation in cow feeding, but for calf nutrition, everybody seemed to have their, their own ideas and their, uh, their own standards. And um, I think there we should, um, should consider that, yeah, the breeds which we are using is always the same. So in the whole world, the majority of cows are Holsteins. Um, or Jersey or whatever, but basically we all working with the same genetic material and the quality of home milk or the quality of milk replaces is also rather standardized. So why shouldn't we go for a standardized feeding program? And uh, yeah, I think I'll just make a, um, a recommendation a little bit later how we, um, yeah, how that could look like. Okay, so when coming up with these programs um, for your herd, can you talk about the need to understand the digestive system and the immune system when determining your calves' nutritional needs? Yeah, and that's something um, where I uh, always have a lot of discussion, uh, and I, to be honest, especially in, in the U.S., uh, where a lot of people still feed a limited amount of milk in order to, to uh, make these calves eat dry feed early on. So, um, and, uh, and that seems to be a quite logical uh, strategy. Um, but one thing which, which we have to consider is that within the first four weeks of age, um, these calves are actually only able to digest milk um, yeah, uh, raw material. So, so the, the enzymes are specialized to digest uh, lactose, so milk sugar. They are specialized to digest milk protein. Um, and they're not, and these calves have no or only a small am amount of enzymes um, with the possibility to, f uh, to digest uh, plant protein. So we shouldn't really expect a significant intake of dry feed which in the, within the first four weeks of age. Only after these four or five weeks, then the enzyme system changes, and then um, these calves have the, uh, have the possibility to digest plant uh, protein, starch, and so on. Uh, and then we can um, expect to have a good um, intake of, of dry feed. Um, and if we are limiting the milk intake Early on, these calves cannot really compensate this by the intake of, um, of concentrates. Uh, yeah. Okay, so we know that a calf, a calf producer's two main goals in raising calves is to have them enter the milking herd quickly and become strong, healthy, and high producing cows. Can you talk about some basic things to consider about feeding? What are some daily practices that you would encourage producers to be following? Um, yeah, basically, I mean, we, we could spend a whole day to discuss this, but um, I think if we, very, uh, if we act closely to the concept of the five C's in calf care, uh, like colostrum, calories, cleanliness, comfort, and consistency, uh, I think we are on the right track already. And I think, um, 
and a lot of the, a lot of uh, webinars and presentations are out there. A lot of literature about colostrum feeding, um, but still, it seems to be one of the biggest, uh, yeah, hurdles on on the farms. And and I think uh, colostrum feeding is rather uh, simple uh, because there are only three things you need to consider. Um, yeah, so and uh, here I'll talk about the th three cues. First, you need to be quick, meaning you need to feed colostrum within the first two hours because the absorption of the antibodies is reducing after that time significantly. Um, second is the quality. So we should use colostrum with, a, with enough IgG, minimum 55 gram IgG. Um, per liter, which is if you're using a BRICS refractor meter, uh, 22, 23 BRICS and more, this is what I would aim for. And then finally, uh, quantity. So, and we would recommend to feed 10% of the birth weight to the calf. So if you have a 50, uh, 40 kilogram Holstein heifer calf, uh, feed four liters or one gallon of milk to this calf. Of the right quality, and as early as possible. And I know that that's sometimes quite difficult on the dairy farm, but um, there are standard procedures available which you should, uh, should look after. And if there's one thing you take out of, only one thing you want to take out of this uh, presentation today, I think it's, it's, it's colostrum, which is very, very important. So moving on then from colostrum, um, talk about calories a little bit. We know calories are obviously extremely important for growth and health. Um, where should they be coming from and how do you measure what a calf needs? Yeah. Um, as I showed in my, my slides earlier, um, uh, the, the calories have to come from milk, especially in the first four weeks of age. So there's no real alternative. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't offer these calves concentrate uh, from two or three weeks on. Uh, I think we should small amounts so that they get familiar with the taste um, and that, that we're preparing them for the intake of, of concentrates. Um, and it has to be palatable. It has to be of good quality, of course. Uh, but don't, like I said, don't expect any significant energy intake from this dry feed. Um, so in the first four weeks, it has to be, it has to be milk. And then we can discuss about weaning. Um, and I would like to show you, um, yeah, a, a rather simple, uh, feeding plan, a feeding curve, which I would, uh, which I would recommend. Um, and this, uh, this feeding curves, uh, curve, um, starts uh, with a lower quantity within the first week we are able to increase or we should increase the milk um, to minimum eight to ten liters per day um, and we should keep this level of milk let's say for the first four to five weeks of age um, like i said already after 14 days we can start with a little bit of dry feed but uh, the majority has to come from milk over here in Europe, we even feed more than that. Over here, we are even feeding them at lip. That means we have a bucket of milk, 10 liters in the morning, one bucket of milk, 10 liters in the evening, and a lot of calves uh, with two or three weeks of age finish, finish two buckets of milk, which is, which is about four to five gallons of milk. Um, and these calves, they are growing one and a half kilo and more per day. So they are go going really well. But the, um, the point is uh, that we need to wean them as well when they are ready to digest dry feed. And this is why we recommend to implement a gradual weaning. So not an abrupt weaning after six, eight weeks, 10 weeks or whatever, where we just skip one feed in the morning and, um, and after a week we are weaning them completely. Um, Gradual weaning starts after five weeks, reduce the milk in small steps every day a little bit um, so that the calves start to eat dry feed. And then we are, then we are able to get them the right amount of energy with the right feed source. Huh? So milk in the first four to five weeks and then 
replace milk uh, with dry feed in the second half, so the second four to five weeks of age. So that would be my, my recommendation. Uh, then you can expect a growth rate of 1,000 gram and more for these calves pre-weaning. So does weather have anything to do with the amount of calories calves need to be taking in? Yeah, definitely. And I mean, uh, I think it's quite obvious. Uh, the colder it gets, uh, the more energy demand these calves have. Um, and uh, the recommendation which we have here um, and what you saw earlier, that is, that is uh, based on, uh, yeah, on conditions like on a, on a very nice spring day, um, sunny, uh, not too hot, not too cold, whatever. Um, but when we are, are in winter and when, it, uh, when we reach freezing temperatures, uh, 30 degrees Fahrenheit and below or zero Celsius and below that, this energy demand of these calves is increasing a lot. So 20, 30% more, or even a very hot summer uh, periods um, when these calves are sweating, they also have a higher energy demand. So you need to adjust that. Uh, you need to adjust the, uh, your feeding program according to, the, um, to these um, conditions. Um, so uh, yeah, that's, that, that's important. Okay, what about water? Um, specifically when calves are on a high calorie diet? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a question which, which always comes up when I, when I tell them, okay, you are able to feed them at lip and they're feeding 20 liters of milk. Uh, do they still need water? Um, and I would, and, and my response always is yes, they need water. Um, uh, because the milk ends up in the abomasum. Um, but what we want is um, we want to develop the rumen um, and the rumen is only developing if there, uh, if there is water in the rumen. So these bacteria, they need water to grow. Um, so we need to offer extra water to these calves as well um, on a ad lib system. Or if you feed more than 10 liters of milk, they will not drink a lot, but they will still drink milk, uh, water. Um, and in a hot summer day, the the, uh, the liquid demand of, of calves uh, is even yeah higher than these 10, 10 liters, what we have here in the graph. Uh, especially in summer, we need to offer extra extra water. That's um, that's very important. Okay, so we talked about colostrum and then calories. Let's dive a little bit into consistency and why is that important in a feeding program. Can you talk a little bit about consistency and routine and why it's important? Yeah, yeah. I think uh, everybody knows that calves like consistency. They want to have the same uh, feeding routine uh, the, the, the same day. So the same amount of feed and uh, the same conditions. Um, and the question is, uh, if we're feeding these high planes of, uh, of milk here, as you can see here in the graph, how are we actually able to get this, uh, um, get, get these, uh, yeah, th this high amount of milk uh, into these calves? Um, and the point is, we need to have a good management. We need to have uh, good routines implemented. Um, and I also uh, would always recommend to use um, yeah, modern technology to do that. Uh, because to carry buckets is not only bad for your back, it's also, uh, yeah, it um, also is, uh, leaves room for human errors, yeah. Um, and here, now I'm coming back to, uh, to feeding technology, which is available. If we're feeding calves uh, with an automatic calf feeder, we have the possibility to wean these calves after five weeks on a very small, uh, uh, with very small steps every day. Um, with normal traditional bucket feeding, it's quite difficult to do that. So here we are able to offer consistency in the weaning uh, to these calves. Um, although the, the milk taxi also has, uh, has possibilities to do that. So we are able to program feeding calves on the newer generation on milk taxis as well. Um, and the second point is, um, now f f first let me just say one word because most of the people are interested in this kind of equipment in order to save labor, but uh, have a closer look on 
what it does for your calves. Yeah. Um, the second point is, and we should uh, touch shortly on this, is uh, the type of um, feed we are feeding. Um, so of course you have the possibility to feed milk replacer, um, but I think we should also consider feeding whole milk uh, more closely because we know that whole milk um, allows, uh, uh, yeah, gives a better digestion, uh, has a better digestibility um, compared to, to milk replacer. So all, if we look through the literature, all the comparing trials where we, where we test whole milk against milk replacer, whole, whole milk always wins. So the calves seem to grow better on whole milk. Um, but the disadvantage with whole milk is hygiene. No? So we need to collect the whole milk in a, in a clean matter. So we need to transport it. Uh, it should be pasteurized and keep in cold conditions. Um, uh, so for feeding whole milk, and in order to keep a certain uh, consistency, uh, feeding technology is also important. Huh? So uh, milk sexy is obviously a good tool to do that. Um, but uh, when you're using an uh, automatic car feeder, um, your storage tank needs to be um, yeah, a cooled uh, storage tank as well. So that, that's important. And not, a lot of people, uh, not all people uh, do that. Um, one thing um, with whole milk is uh, uh, maybe a small disadvantage. We see some variation in dry matter concentration in whole milk sometimes. Um, so the Briggs refractor meter, which we are using to, um, to measure the, um, uh, the quality of colostrum can also be used to measure the quality, the dry matter content of, of your whole milk. Um, and we have possibilities to, um, to um, fortify the whole milk uh, with milk replacer, um, um, with a milk taxi, for example. Uh, so there's a feature called Smart Mix um, where um, yeah, you're able to add a certain amount of whole milk to overcome variations here. Huh? So, and that's um, very, uh, yeah, very important when we talk about uh, consistent uh, consistency. Um, just let me say last, last word, uh, consistency, especially uh, that's difficult on larger uh, operations where you have different uh, personnel working. Um, in the morning, one uh, shift is feeding the calves. In the afternoon, another shift is feeding the calves. Also here, can, technology can help. Um, I would always recommend uh, you to uh, to use modern feeding techno uh, modern uh, technology to monitor data. So your car feeders, your milk taxis are uh, recording information. You are able to leave, uh, you're able to connect these uh, with, uh, with apps, with uh, management tools, um, like our calf guide uh, software. Um, uh, and using this modern technology helps to keep the whole staff, the whole team on the same information level. Um, so to take the yeah, human error out of the, um, out of the procedure. So um, yeah, I think that's, um, that's also very important um, yeah, to have a look at that. So that yeah, the management uh, in, on your farm, in your operation is on a certain um, yeah, one level with everybody. Thank you, Holger. I certainly think we all learned um, some new tidbits today about calf feeding. Um, just a little bit of a reminder, I do see some questions coming in in the question and answer section um, of your Zoom. Um, if you can type your questions over in the chat box and then send it to all the panelists and attendees, um, we'll all be able to see those questions then. Um, and we'll get to those at the end, like I said before. So next up, I'm excited to introduce to you Kelly Driver. Kelly is CAFTEL's Eastern US and Canada Territory Manager. Um, to continue our CAF 101 discussion, we're gonna be talking about CAF Housing uh, 101. Kelly, will you go into your background a little bit and talk about your experience in CAF care and some details about your role here at CAFTEL? 
Sure. Thank you, Abby. Um, I'm happy to be with you all today. I have actually spent my entire life in the dairy industry here in New York State, um, in the United States, from growing up on a farm to my current role here at CapTel, which includes working with dairy producers and our authorized CapTel dealers across the eastern U.S. and Canada, um, always looking to find the best solutions for their calf rearing needs. Um, for CAFTEL, I also coordinate our Calf Corner blog, and I enjoy writing some of that content as well. And I guess um, on the cow side of it, I've owned and bred brown Swiss cattle for over 40 years, um, stemming from a 4-H project. And I enjoy raising calves and heifers um, with my family, and my milk cows live in a um, neighboring 1,400 cow dairy where I'm uh, involved a bit too. So I guess to kick this off this morning, I'd like to start with two quick poll questions um, to see kind of where the audience is at on some topics that um, frequently are discussion points for calf comfort and calf housing. I think hopefully we can share that poll. Let's see. Marco, do you have those questions? Perfect. They are. So the first question is, what percentage of overall heifer rearing costs are incurred in the pre-weaning period? Um, would it be 15%, 18%, 26%, or 33%? And uh, the second question is, what is that calf's thermal neutral zone? Is it 45 to 65 degrees Fahrenheit or 7 to 18 degrees Celsius? 55 to 74 degrees Fahrenheit, 65 to 82 Fahrenheit, or 18 to 27 degrees Celsius, or 75 to 92 degrees Fahrenheit. We'll give that a couple seconds and um, then Marco can pull up the results for us. So maybe we can pull up those results now. And there we have it, actually. Um, so the first question, 37% um, actually said 26%, and that, that's a pretty accurate answer. And on their second question, uh, the thermal neutral zone is actually 65 to 82 degrees Fahrenheit. And I realize we have some conversion between Celsius and Fahrenheit, but it um, is actually 65 to 82 degrees Fahrenheit or 18 to 27 degrees Celsius. So let's um, move on from that. Great. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, Kelly, we're going to dive right in then. Um, let's talk about why proper housing and care of young calves plays such an important role in raising healthy and productive herd members. Um, well, to to start with, I think we can't emphasize enough how important old holders points are about getting enough high quality colostrum into that calf within those first few hours of life. Um, along with providing them with clean calving and housing environment and clean feeding utensils to set them up for all of the opportunity for success. As part of that, housing plays a pretty important role, I think, from the first moments in the calving area, being clean, um, getting those calves dried off in a suitable, clean, warming area, certainly during colder temperatures. Um, the housing areas should be clean, they should be free of dust, they should have adequate bedding, and um, certainly provide ventilation without providing a draft on those calves. The, Dairy Calf and Heifer Association Gold Standards target two pounds per day of daily gain at a minimum for pre-weaned calves, which has them doubling their birth weight uh, prior to weaning. Calves are most comfortable in that thermal neutral zone that we spoke about of 65 to 82 degrees Fahrenheit. And for each degree above or below that, we need to accommodate for the additional energy requirements of the calf. Um, for Jersey calves in particular, their surface area to body weight ratio is greater, so that creates a greater heat loss potential in cold weather, 
And that is why we often um, see them fed higher fat diets to meet those demands as was shown in the work of um, Bascom and their team at Virginia Tech. There are ways in housing that we can influence this and we can impact it as simply as a properly fitted calf tail calf jacket, um, which contain 200 grams of fencilate batting compared to a simple polyfill fluff batting that offers no true insulating value to, to our baby calves. Um, I think sometimes if we think of that in human terms, um, I like to equate it to the difference between skiing down a mountainside with a properly fitted fencilate line jacket on um, or, or skiing down the mountainside with a simple thin windbreaker that might even actually be too big for us. Um, I think there's a, there's a big difference in how we can influence and, and help them in their energy requirements. So in addition to being easily cleaned between calves, another way that housing um, helps is temperature control and, and lack of drafts. So calf tail hutches have been specifically designed over the years with an upper ridge um, that offers front and rear, rear vents. And then in warmer temperatures, the rear bedding door and the lower rear vents can certainly be opened as well to allow more airflow through the, the hutch. And those lower rear vents can certainly give us a little fresh air at the calf's nose level when they're lying down. Similarly, the rear bedding door on the large uh, 5498 hutch that we see here um, can also be left open for additional air airflow in the summer heat. So one new product that Captel has recently released is called um, our Breezeway Front and Rear Options for Indoor Calf Pens that allow for more natural air movement through the pens um, in the calf barn. The Air Max pen backs already offered are a great option for airflow um, in, in warmer temperatures. And then that rear panel also offers an option to drop a, a door in, if you will, uh, that prevents drafts on our youngest calves in the winter. So research has shown an increase of 12,000 pounds of production in the first two lactations for cattle that have lower incidence of calfhood respiratory disease and and Holger referenced some of, some of that work um, done at Cornell University earlier. When we consider that Kurt Gooch's work also done at Cornell shows that 26% of our overall um, cost of raising a replacement on a farm is incurred during the pre-weaning period, I think it magnifies the importance of proper housing and calf care in the overall economics of our dairy operations. Good information. So let's talk about goals a little bit like we did with Holger. When coming up with this housing program, what type of goals should producers or calf managers consider? Well, I think um, the goal in all calf housing is absolutely to fulfill all the basic needs of the calf. And that includes providing them with a clean, dry, comfortable bed, really good nutrition, pathogen control, adequate draft and re-ventilation. Um, all of those things are certainly obviously considered. We also need to, to think about giving them free access to clean water, um, ongoing individual observation by a calf caregiver in whatever environment we place them in. And um, other goals can also sometimes include increased labor efficiency, uh, reduced morbidity or mortality in the operation, uh, safety and ease of handling perhaps for both the calves and the caregivers and, and always um, a measure, of, a good measure of biosecurity. Obviously, when you look around at farms today, there's not one way to calf housing. You see a lot of different setups. Would you say that there are some universal factors that producers generally consider when they're coming up with their housing program? Um, I think this actually ties into our previous question a little bit about goals. Um, I think once farms kind of kind of wrap their head around what the, what the goals are they're trying to achieve when they consider housing and new housing um, before they embark on designing or building or, or whatever prepping a site for calf housing. It's certainly not a one size or style fits all project um, when, we, when we begin to consider all those things. 
it really becomes a bit of a balancing act maybe between costs and overall calf health and safety, labor efficiency, uh, and always assuring that all those basic um, needs are, are met to give those calves the best opportunity for success. I think sometimes um, this balance of doing all the right things or, or certainly striving to do all the right things is where CAFTEL draws their slogan, um, heart meets smart. I think as calf feeders and calf raisers, we, we tend to think not just with our brains, but also with our heart a lot in the same, same thought process. So let's shift gears a little bit and talk about some general basic things to consider um, with calf housing. Okay, so let's uh, think about, I guess the location of the calves certainly is very important. When we start to consider location, um, we wanna think about things like the direction of the prevailing breeze. We certainly want the housing to be distanced enough um, from barns that dust and pathogens are not being exhausted out of a barn and onto the calf raising area or into their barn, things like that. Uh, we, we always strive to locate it so that prevailing winds are not blowing across any manure storage areas um, and far enough away from those areas to um, help us with appropriate fly control to keep the calves comfortable. And we um, try to distance from, I guess also one other thing we have to think about too in our location is the distance from the barn or the pasteurizer um, to provide that milk is delivered always at a consistent and correct temperature. There's three basic housing categories that we um, can, can often lump housing into. There's individual housing, paired housing, and group housing. And there's several reasons why producers might consider each one. Um, and these will need to align with the goal of the operation that we, we chatted about a moment ago. Uh, the key to helping calves flourish through weaning and beyond is having them then, then in an environment that is, that is clean and easy to clean and disinfect between calves, keeping them dry and comfortable. And when they are grouped, keeping them in smaller groups um, with calves of a similar size. So certainly plastic housing gives us an opportunity to keep them, them clean and clean them in between calves. And it's less likely to harbor pathogens than perhaps our wooden housing options that we uh, sometimes encounter. We see many producers using smaller barns or even rows of hutches that are being filled on an all in all out format and then the calves are filling each segment of the barn or hutches, whatever the situation might be in seven to 10 days and being weaned and moved in a similar fashion um, into small groups of four to six calves with terrific results. Um, paired housing is certainly getting quite a bit of discussion currently, um, thanks in part to Jennifer Van Oss's work at, at University of Wisconsin that shows the benefits of social behaviors, cognitive development in paired calves. Um, they often will eat calf starter earlier and perhaps in better quantities sooner. Um, the benefits of play in their development and things like that. So whether calves are paired or grouped in hutches or pens, it seems that we are also hearing that food consumers uh, prefer that animals have some level of early interaction or friendship um, and this is certainly an area of discussion when we, when we think about making an investment in new calf housing options. So just like we did with Holger, Kelly and I are going to chat a little bit about the five C's of calf rearing. Specifically, we're going to focus on cleanliness, comfort, and consistency. So let's start with the first one, cleanliness. Um, let's talk about the important, in, importance to the overall well-being of the calf and how cleanliness can help prevent future health problems. Um, from the first time the calf is born to the time it's moving in and out of calf housing, what are some things that will reduce the spread of disease among calves? Sure, Abby, thanks. Um, some things that 
reduce the spread of disease among pre-weaned calves can include using um, clean bottles and esophageal feeders to deliver colostrum initially, um, starting them off in individual housing, uh, particularly a plastic housing to, um, I equate sometimes the plastic pen or the hutch, whatever we're placing that calf in to the plastic bassinet that we often place newborn human babies in in a, in a hospital shortly after delivery. Um, if we think about it in that, that context, I think they're easy to clean um, and, and for obvious reasons, important to their, their early health. Uh, we keep in mind that newborn calves have an undeveloped immune system and that makes housing them in areas with clean, uh, non-porous surfaces very important. And if we place those newborns into say a wooden housing environment, um, that we have a pretty like, good likelihood that we might be immersing them in, in all the pathogens that wood is harboring from previous calves um, or areas where, where that housing has been set. So it'll, it would too often allow some bacteria to grow that is a early on challenge to those calves. Um, some of the best practices for cleaning are to pick that plastic housing up and move it to another site for pressure washing to remove the organic matter. Uh, we wanna move it away as you see in the picture on the right here, um, to prevent any pathogens from traveling in water spray to any surrounding calves. Um, some calf caregivers also will disinfect those plastics with a chlorine dioxide solution or chlorine of some sort, um, and then allow them to air dry. While the plastic housing is moved, it's pretty important on the cleanliness note to obviously scrape away all the manure pack from the site uh, move it far enough away from the site that it's not attracting flies. Um, as we hear where I am in, in the Northeast United States, uh, it's fly season now and it's pretty warm and flies can be a big issue in these kind of temperatures and they certainly can be also a disease carrier. So we definitely want to do all we can to minimize that. So our next C happens to be comfort. Um, we want to keep the calves comfortable. We know that they need to be healthy, so they, they need comfort. Um, so what can a producer do to provide a comfortable li living situation for their calves? Sure. Um, I think the, the first thing we think about in comfort is, is having enough space to move about freely. Um, in, in my area, I'm encountering some milk processing companies that are actually requiring pre-weaned calves to have a minimum of 20 square feet per calf so that they can move about freely. Um, that, and that's the minimum that they're recommending. It, it varies by region, but there are important items related to comfort, obviously like clean, dry bedding, good air quality, temperatures, fly control, so many, so many items like that. Um, as we mentioned earlier, the calf is also comfortable at temperatures between 65 and 82 degrees Fahrenheit. And outside of this, their body is requiring some extra energy. Um, access to extra feedings, electrolytes, water delivered, particularly on a day like today here in the Northeast where it's very hot. Um, those Delivering those items uh, to them at least twice a day, uh, perhaps an extra feeding of milk in the winter or something midday in order to help them meet their, their calorie requirements. Good ventilation is a significant factor in the health and well-being of calves. Um, some diseases spread through air and inadequate air exchange, particularly in calf barns, and um, can certainly present a challenge with higher pathogen loads. Natural ventilation, mechanical ventilation, a combination of two can all provide continuous fresh air throughout the seasons to help keep our calves healthy. Um, the picture on the right hand side here on the screen was actually sent to me by a producer last week after they installed some additional ceiling fans in their calf bar. Um, and and this calf raiser told me that she actually had to take the calves temperatures to be certain that they were okay because they were kind of laying in awkward positions. 
And when I got this, I first kind of giggled, but then I think if we go back to how our human newborns sometimes are, they, they like to lay in some pretty awkward sleep in some pretty awkward positions as well with their heads tipped in, in funny fashion. And we wonder if they can even be comfortable, but certainly these, these calves clearly are very, very happy laying under those fans on a hot day. A question that sometimes I get asked um, is about the difference between a ventilation and a draft. And I think air movement is generally considered a draft at a speed of 60 feet per minute. Um, and of course, this is also impacted by humidity um, management. We can influence it with the use of calf jackets in the winter. Um, and certainly with the depth and the type of bedding and getting those calves nested down, down into a good bed of, of straw in the winter can certainly impact that. There are several universities that offer programs that can be great resource when you're um, designing proper calf housing specific to your site. Um, two that I reference quite a bit, I guess, are the Dairyland Institute at the UW-Madison and Cornell University's Pro Dairy Program. And I think hopefully Abby's going to share the links uh, to both of those websites with you. Those websites are full of good information. And, and I guess along with that, I also want to say that we should always, always have our herd veterinarians involved um, when we consider any housing um, new housing discussions or, or changes in housing, they can be a terrific resource of information for producers as well. Great. So we talked about cleanliness and comfort. Lastly, we're going to touch on consistency. What housing habits can calves flourish the most from? Why is consistency even a factor when you're considering um, housing for your calves? Well, I, I think Holger touched on consistency quite well earlier, but um, I think what what works on one farm in the way of housing may not work for another um, at times, just because of the difference in goals and, and things like that. But uh, we always want to be consistent and, and certainly enforce a newborn calf protocol and calf care plan. Um, that is absolutely consistent from day to day. Um, the, the colostrum is clearly a, a vital piece of that. Proper management can greatly reduce the illness and the death rates of calves. Um, we always want to provide clean, fresh calf starter milk, milk replacer, and water consistently every day. The consistency and, and appropriate temperatures of delivery are important. Um, making sure that we offer enough water, electrolytes, and clearly total calories to the calf um, to assure that they're not feeling heat or cold stress and, and more than meeting their needs um, for adequate growth. We can't say enough about cleaning protocols uh, for both feeding equipment and housing to assure a healthy environment for that calf to flourish in. And I think there's just so many little details that if we're consistent um, as a group and a, and a team that feed those calves, um, they all tie together to assure a healthy calf with good growth weights, which is um, a good goal for all of us. Great. Well, thank you, Kelly. Today's series has definitely um, provided us all with some good education um, on some basic principles of calf care. Well, as promised, um, we'll go ahead and take some questions at this time. Um, if you still have some questions coming in, just as a reminder, type them over in the chat box. Um, but we'll start off here. Let me just scroll up to the top. All right. So Holger, this one is for you. From Marcel, why only milk during the first four weeks and not water or hay or something. Yeah, or hay. <laughs> um, water as well. And I think we, we, we mentioned that water is uh, also in that period is important to offer that freely um, right from, from the first day. If they drink it or not, 
doesn't matter. You, you should offer that uh, it to them. Um, hay and concentrates, we can also offer small amounts. Uh, so because they will not eat a lot. And if you give them too much, they will maybe play with it or it's getting um, wet and moldy. And that's, that, that, that's not really good. So within the first four weeks, um, like I said, dry feed is still, uh, is also important, but don't expect them to have a significant intake. No? So offer them to, to, to play with it, to get used to it. So that after four to five weeks, when their metabolism changes, that they then have already the, a good taste of it and they can start to, um, to increase their intake um, faster, yeah. Okay. Holger, another one for you, from Megan. In the Northern US, we get very harsh cold temperatures. How do, you, how do your feeding recommendations change with cold weather? And alternatively, does it change with hot temperature? Yeah, um, when you're feeding high planes of nutrition um, throughout the year already, um, cold weather, uh, so, so we're feeding a lot of energy already. So, uh, but like I said earlier, um, we need to take, uh, we, we need to take into consideration that uh, in, in the winter, the energy demand of these calves can be 20 to 30% higher. Um, and of course, we can use calf jackets, and uh, I think they can compensate at least 20% of that energy already. Um, uh, good bedding helps as well, um, but uh, I would also recommend there in winter to have a little bit more energy as well. So depending if you're using calf jackets or not. So without calf jackets, you should feed 20 to 30% more energy. With calf jackets, maybe 10 to 20% more energy. With hot weather, weather um, same thing. I mean, um, like Kelly said, the, the, the calves are um, able to manage warmer temperatures better than cows. Yeah, so uh, for calves, 25 degrees Celsius is not a real stress. Um, but when it's getting really warm, then also they have more energy demand uh, and we need to offer them uh, enough energy. And as well, the point when it's getting too hot, they don't like to drink so much. So then we are not able to get this, uh, the, the energy intake. So maybe it is important to increase the uh, milk replacer concentration, for example, so that in every liter and every quart we have, we have more energy. Um, and I think Joe has also put a question and maybe I just answer that because he said, that they're trying to increase the milk solids to 14%, uh, but it didn't seem to work. Um, and that is possible because high planes of nutrition, if you want to feed that, you need to feed either whole milk, with whole milk it works perfectly, with milk replacer, you need to feed the top quality milk replacer. Uh, so any average milk replacer, cheap, medium price, whatever, um, um, normally shows a lower digestibility. Um, and if you feed too much of that, a too high concentration that can, uh, that can cause these upset uh, tummies um, and that can be a limit. So especially in summer, you really need to look at the uh, very high quality milk replacer. Kelly, we have one for you. What would you suggest for the floor under the straw in the hutches for good drainage? Ah, good question. I should have talked about that maybe. Um, so under hutches, typically, normally we see um, a, a bed of gravel that provides some drainage. Um, and then Sometimes on that, on top of that, we see people do a number of different things. We see some landscape fabric used with um, a bed of shavings. We see some sand um, that can be scraped up and, and removed from the area for before the new group goes down or the new group of hutches are reset. And then um, certainly we see shavings um, with uh, even straw on top in the winter but certainly something with drainage. And I guess on the drainage point for indoor housing where, where there is 
concrete, we tend to try to slope those floors with some grooving uh, to provide drainage to a to a central drain of some sort. Kelly, I have a question, is if, if I may. Um, because I saw on your Facebook page just this week, was it yesterday or the day before, a video you shared um, about uh, winter as uh, summer uh, bedding uh, that, um, that, that uh, you're using straw and then putting wood shavings on top, uh, whereas in winter you do it the other way around. Um, so wood shaving on the bottom and then straw on the top, probably for better insulation. Um, can you say anything about that? Um, I'm not sure what Facebook page you're referring to, honestly, because I've been traveling uh, in ah. a pretty rural area the last four hours, but okay. <laughs> um, it is uh, certainly, yes, we see a lot of wood shavings with straw on top in the winter. Mm -hmm. And then um, I don't see a lot of straw base necessarily um, in the summer, just, just the wood shavings or sand even to keep calves cooler. Ah, okay, good. Yeah, thank you. All right, so this one could go to Holger or Kelly. Um, how do you practically wean gradually in a group house system with milk bars? Uh, difficult, huh? So you have you have have a large milk bar, and then you have four, five, ten calves around. Um, yeah, difficult. Um, generally, I would re always recommend to have these animals, th these calves, in this group uh, as close uh, in, in a uh, as close in age difference as possible. Yeah, so. Not sure, I would say not more than one week apart. Um, especially with a with, with a milk taxi, we have the possibility um, to run um, a weaning curve also for groups of calves. Uh, so then the milk taxi will identify this bucket uh, or this pen, not just as an individual calf, but as a group of calf. And there we are able to wean them gradually. Um, although we have no control of what every individually calf's uh, calf drinks. Yeah? So, but there we have the possibility to reduce that mi the milk into that bucket uh, over a longer, longer time. I think I would only add to what Holger said to say that um, sometimes what I see people doing with milk bars um, also is, is leaving them there for a couple extra minutes and letting those calves um, chew and play with the nipple. And we see this a bit in some of the paired housing research as well, that as those calves have that opportunity to play with it, then they see um, a bit less cross-sucking as well. And I think I saw a cross-sucking question come up in the chat, and that's why I thought maybe we could address that here. But what we see on the step down and where they have that opportunity to play just a bit with that nipple for a couple minutes, it seems to reduce that cross-sucking. All right, so we have time for one more question here. All right, so after weaning at 70 days, what is considered a good weight gain on 18% calf ratio at free choice and free choice grass hay available as well? <laughs> Well, girl, I'm going to let you do that. I don't see a lot of, uh, of free choice hay fed to calves at that age. So I think that might be a more geared to your part of the world question. Yeah. Um, yeah, right. This, this is uh, yeah, hay or um, TMR silage. That, that, that's what, we've, what we're feeding uh, for wean calves. Um, and I would still, even after weaning, uh, after weaning of the milk, until the calves are, I would say, like half a year old, I would still aim for a, uh, for at least 900 to 1,000 gram daily weight gain. Um, and um, yeah, whatever feed you are feeding to these calves uh, should allow that that weight gain. Uh, so, and normally with a 18 percent uh, uh, concentrate, that that should that should work. Um, but these calves also, they, they, they need some roughage and, um, 
And if you're feeding them only hay as the only roughage, maybe these calves get too much, um, yeah, roughage inside, uh, the, uh, the, the roughage intake with low energy is, is too much. So uh, I would probably recommend to have some silage, um, offering them some silage after, I don't know, uh, four or five months of age. I think it's important to work with your herd veterinarian and nutritionist on really dialing that into your own, yeah. your own specific situation and, and certainly uh, the components of your program. The, the, the problem with the weaning is that um, sometimes, well, very often people see uh, the gap, so the, uh, the growth growth check after weaning, uh, which normally should not be there. If you have a good uh, feeding program, you shouldn't see a significant drop in, in weight gain because this is a, a real problem with the, with the calves. And if you have that, you should have a look um, into your feeding uh, routines. And like Kelly said, maybe you should get some advisor to have a look um, to get an outside view um, in order to improve your, your system. All right. Well, that is all the time we have for questions today. Of course, if you have any additional questions, um, please feel free to reach out to any of us at CAFTEL or over at Home and Lau. Um, the easiest way might be through our social media. Um, or, of course, you can go to the website and find our contact information there. Um, but before we wrap up, Holger or Kelly, do you have any ending thoughts here? <laughs> Um, not so much about calf feeding, um, but more about management. I think, um, and nowadays I know we have so many webinars offered out, out there in the market and you, the farmers have, have the possibility to, to gather a lot of very useful information. And I think everybody will take, uh, two or three points out of our, um, presentations here. Um, the point is just, you need to get it done on your farm. And I think this is the biggest challenge. Huh? So to, to spend uh, one and a half hours here with us is one thing, um, but to implement like just two or three things on your dairy farm, uh, it's a big challenge. And um, yeah, try to get uh, a few points out of what we just discussed and make this a routine on your farm. If it's a very small step, it's great huh? because it's improving your system already. If it's two small steps, it's already a big step. So, so um, and that's something I think um, which is which is very important. Um, yeah, try to get something out of our webinar today, which you think might work on your your farm. I guess along with that, um, certainly we, we took this from a calf housing and calf feeding 101 perspective, sign, kind of some uh, basic stuff, but I think it's important um, when you're contemplating any kind of a, a housing change or a feeding change, draw on the resources around you, whether it's Holger, myself, my, the rest of my calf tail team um, across, across the country, the globe, and um, your herd veterinarians, your nutritionists, and in your neighboring farms, if you're lucky enough, you know, to be in an area where there are other farms, you can learn a lot from, from those people and their experiences as well. Great. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. We appreciate you all showing up and being here. Our next webinar will take place over Zoom again. Um, we don't have dates out yet for that, but connect with us on Facebook or Instagram because we'll be sure to, to share those dates with you in the future um, and some information on future topics. So thank you again for joining us and we'll see you next time. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you.